Hello and welcome to episode 5 of the Karo Khan vs Everything speedrun. In this series, I play two 10 minute plus 5 second rapid games with game analysis after each one of the games, which will be timestamped below. And I play the Karo Khan with the black pieces and the Karo Khan set up with the white pieces. It's actually technically the Saragossa opening with the white pieces, but it's basically the Karo Khan. I've been recently enjoying throwing in moves like A3 and A6 to just get further control over the C4 or, sorry, B4 or B5 squares, depending on which color I'm playing. I believe it's known as like the goat or the ghost or something. Um, I think of Walter, it is Walter or something in the comments was telling me about it. Anyway, uh, just to, as a quick update, I have got a new webcam, a new mic and a new mouse because... I've got to spend for a bit for you guys. I've got to increase the video quality a bit. So I hope the... I mean, I'm sure the um, like actual webcam footage is way better. Whether the audio quality is better, I'm not exactly sure. Because I'm obviously not wearing the headset. I've got a microphone. So please let me know uh, your thoughts on that, whether it's improved or not. I, I hope I don't have to switch back to the headset. But maybe I can mess around with the settings a bit if it's not amazing. Anyway, with that being said, let's jump into game one. Um, I did actually already record game one um which is why my rating isn't actually in line with what it should be my opponent abandoned after like four minutes of just not moving after we went into a fantasy variation and i went i went into a really in-depth explanation about the fantasy variation like playing as the black pieces so i may release that as um some kind of footage or short or maybe i'll put it in the discord for those that are interested but anyway let's get into game one and let's get a win all right, we have the white pieces against Miliaman, Miliaman from Poland. Let's start with C3. Again, the Saragossa opening, but the Karo Khan in um, all seriousness. We could have started with A3, to be fair, and then just gone for C3, D4 to essentially pass the turn back to my opponent. So we're basically playing the black pieces. But my opponent goes, um, okay, he just Fienketo's his bishop instead. So we're not going to get a normal Karo setup, which, I mean, okay, I can't really do a lot about that. Let's just develop normally. Knight f3. I'm not playing bishop f4 because I'm not playing the London. I refuse to. We could go bishop g5, though, and attack the queen. Yeah, let's actually do that. Let's do that. Now, obviously, the knight is defending the bishop, and the knight is attacked by the bishop, but... We induced the move f6, which is fantastic news, because this diagonal is now significantly weakened by that f6 move. Now we could drop the bishop to f4, and I know it would look kind of like a London, but with the inclusion of f6, I don't know if I would count it. We could also go back to h4, but I think f4 is more principled, because we control the e5 square. So let's do that. I'm not counting this as a London setup. Um, like, whatever the opposite of a shout-out is, that, to all my London players watching, um, I have no regrets in insulting you. So knight c6 controls e5. I just want to make sure e5 doesn't happen successfully. We have one, two, three defenders. He has one, two attackers, so we're good. I think e3 would be a nice move to open the bishop up and also get the queen ready to come to h4. Five. If we can play something like e3, bishop d3, if this knight moves, then queen h5, g6, bishop g6, pawn g6, queen h8 will be pretty deadly. We could go e4. We could go e4, but then we would block this off. And it's also not really in the spirit of the Karo Khan to push e4. Normally you want these two pawns supporting either the d5 pawn or the d4 pawn, if you're looking at it from the white side. So yeah, I don't know how much I really rate Black's development here. He's kind of just moving a lot of pawns. And I mean, we've moved a lot of pawns, but we're taking a lot of central space. His pawns, I mean, f6 is just a weakness, and e6 is going to e5, so putting it on e6 was a waste of a move anyway. d6 makes sense, obviously, because he's trying to support an e5 push. But let's say we go bishop d3, e5. I was trying to make some sacrifice work, but I don't think it does. The king can just run away, I think. Yeah, the king's fine, probably. 
Um, he can play e5. But we can just drop the bishop back. We could also play bishop b5 to pin his knight. To make e5 a bit more difficult to pull off. I'm going to play that. If he goes a6, I'm going to go bishop a4. And if he goes b5, I'm going to drop back to b2. Sorry, c2. And my reasoning is... I wanted to go bishop d3, but after e5, I wanted to retreat my bishop, and e4 would have come with a fork, potentially, if this knight moved, right? So, instead, I bait out a6 and b5, which were very reasonable moves, because this pin was quite annoying, but it means my bishop's on c2 rather than d3, so it's on the same diagonal, but it's not vulnerable to any e4 pushes. So... Yeah, I think I'm going to drop the bishop back to g3. I might hop this knight into h4 to try and take advantage of the weak light squares and also open my queen up. This could get very dangerous for black very, very quickly. And my opponent is still playing fairly fast, which could come back to bite him because he really needs to be considering how he goes about this position. He's quite overextended with some of his pawns, I feel like. a4 could be a bit of a problem for him. D5 could be a bit of an issue to kick the knight at some point. Maybe not immediately. Knight E7 makes sense because he's controlling G6 and F5. But I think knight to H4 is still a very good move. Because we are we are threatening this. Because if he goes knight here, we obviously take it. But knight H4, if we play queen H4 and G6, we can take... And if the pawn takes, we take the rook. And if the knight takes, then the bishop takes, pawn takes, and then we take the rook. So I'm going to do it. He can't develop this bishop, which... Like, the only way he develops this bishop is to move this knight. But this knight can't feasibly move anywhere. We're also taking the g6 square away from the knight. Although, if it had gone to g6, queen h4 would have been good anyway. But we need to move the knight to enable that. As a bit of a side note, the knight also defends g2, so if this knight moves to open the bishop up, we're fine. I don't care if he takes me, because we're just going to play queen to h4 all the same. But even if he takes me and we take back, we can take back with either pawn very easily. Probably with the c pawn, so we can put the knight on c3. Although taking with the e pawn would also be fine to try and open the e file, so we can like castle and put a rook on e1. Very, very comfortable position here. And we're getting a lot of just, like, the normal Karo Khan things. Like, we've got the bishop outside of the pawn chain. And then locked in with e3 to support the d4 pawn. Which isn't necessary, but it's nice. Okay, my opponent goes g6. Which is logical, because he stops queen to h5. Now, this does weaken f6. So, the first move that comes to mind is queen f3. Although I think knight to d4 is quite scary then. Because the bishop is hanging, but so is our bishop. And with check, and our rook will hang. To be honest, I don't know how to best exploit this. I don't know if there is an obvious way to do so. So we could literally just castle. And not worry about it. Um, we could just castle, maybe even try for f4. To blast open the, the f file for our rook. Moves like knight d2 are perfectly reasonable, maybe looking for e4 to go after the pawn. But moves like bishop g7 will always defend. So, unless I'm just completely wrong and I missed something, I think this is a fine move. You know, g5 can never be played because we'll give the check. Queen d7, I guess my opponent wants to castle queenside. We could throw in a4 to discourage that. And if he pushes b4, maybe we have d5 to try and dislodge the knight's defense of the pawn. Something like knight a5 takes knight c4, bishop b3 looks pretty good to me. Just as a sample line. f4 is quite a dangerous move, I think, for black to deal with. Because he can't push, because we'll just take it. Right? And if he takes us... Okay, you can take there, I suppose. But then I think we can just take back with the e-pawn and open up the e-file. I don't really want to take with the c-pawn. We also have moves like f5 to just cramp his position up. 
Uh, yeah, taking with the sea pawn doesn't make much sense to me. Let's just have an insane grip over the dark squares. And in the same way that in the Karo Khan you have c6, d5, and you have big control over the light squares, we're doing that but in reverse, which is kind of the whole point of the speed run, right? Because we are playing the Karo Khan, but with both the black pieces and the white pieces employing the same ideas. So in with black with the, in the Karo Khan, you want to dominate the light squares. We're doing that with the dark squares because the roles are reversed. Bishop b3 looks like a tempting move to stop my opponent from castling. f5 is also tempting because if he takes, we just win. I mean, if he takes, we can just play queen h5 anyway, and it's game over. If he doesn't do anything, we might be able to take him. We're also opening this bishop up and opening the rook up. So if we push, I'm expecting g5 to lock things down. But then we can play queen h5 all the same. My opponent couldn't give this check, but it doesn't do anything. It, his bishop is just going to be vulnerable. I really like this move. We have a lot of support for the uh, f5 pawn. But the real purpose of this is to try and dislodge the g6 pawn that is defending the vital h5 checking square. And the bishop on h6 is actually just making itself vulnerable. I don't really know what the purpose of it was. Yeah, here we can just go queen h5. And, um... Yeah, he's in check. He can't block because we have way too much control over that square. Um... I assume he's going to move his king to d8 because if he goes to f8, I'm going to take the bishop with check. So, king d8. We can take the bishop. He takes us. Bishop takes h4. We go up a pawn, and we have a lot of pressure. You can argue he might have pressure on g2, mm, but I don't believe in it. We do technically have some development issues. We need, we need to develop our queen side a bit. But we are good. Like, we're fine. Take, take. We could actually take on f6 because we're attacking the rook. Take on f6, something like rook g8. Here, here. We could always offer a trade of queens if we want. Not in this exact position, but it's just an option. But we could actually just play queen h4. Ooh, that looks really nice. Queen f6, rook g8, queen h4. We keep the g-file blocked with the bishop, and we get ready to play f6. Which also gives the opportunity to bring the bishop out if this knight moves. And we are, we are just kind of threatening to promote. So let's do it. Let's do it. He can't really take our bishop because we're going to take here. And we're going to force a queen trade. And we just go up and exchange and like what, like two pawns or something, so that's obviously not playable for black. And yeah, although we are kind of playing without two pieces, we are completely dominating this game. Let's take on h4, go with our plan. I didn't like bishop takes, I know we put massive pressure here, but he's well defended, and I want to move the f pawn, and I also want to keep the g file blocked. So the bishop on g3 I think does very good defensive duties, and also enables our queen to move out of the way. So that we can start pushing the f-pawn. Which is probably our biggest asset in this position. Like, completely passed. And we have really, really good support for its movement. f6. Knight g6. Then we have moves like bishop f5 pinning the queen. I know our queen is under attack. We could also just take on h7. To put pressure on the rook, pressure on the knight. And f6 could be an issue. But let's just calculate f6 first, straight away, because it's probably the most forcing line. Knight g6. Bishop takes. Pawn takes. f6, rook f8. That's not immediately winning, is it? So I'm actually just going to take on h7. We're going to go up three pawns. I know we are giving him lines to attack our king. But I think we're well defended. He lacks firepower. We could even just play this slowly by you know bringing our knight out. But queen d8, okay. I think that just allows f6. 
I mean, obviously we were threatening F6 to dislodge the knight's defense of the rook. Um, we all... Okay, what if we do F6? F6... If knight g6, then uh, e... Sorry, F7 is kind of a problem. Because his rook could get overloaded. Here, let's say knight d5. F7, rook f8... Oh, we also have checks to win the knight. Yeah, I think this is the most forcing line. And it should be a fairly simple conversion. Because we're just kind of like forcing the issue onto black. We're not giving him any time to breathe. Like, a move like knight d2 is probably completely reasonable. Or a move like bishop h4 is probably quite reasonable. But... Why give Black time to try and generate some counterplay when we can just go at him? And yeah, I think we can play Queen F5 check here to pick up the knight. Um, I know we are aligning with the bishop, but let's say Queen F5, King B8, Queen D5, um, Knight E5, Queen E6... Black has no counterplay. So we could just win a piece. F7 is also worth calculating. We could just throw it in. And force Rook F8 and then give the check. And then go into this line. It, I don't think it makes a difference. F7 Rook here. It does allow the Queen to get out. But I don't think that's an issue. Hmm. Am I thinking too hard about this? We also have bishop b3, looking at this. Which looks strong, but like knight a5, and he's probably okay. Let's just win the piece. Let's just win the piece. I'm getting a bit low on time. I'm trying to find an immediate win. But, you know, not every attack has to end in checkmate. An attack can end in a massive gain of material. And if we're going to go at three pawns and a knight that's a massive gain of material. Like, there's no reason I should be losing this, especially with the G-file blocked by my bishop. And I decided to leave the pawn on F6 so that this queen couldn't get involved in any way, which was kind of my only concern. Although, you know, I'm probably still fine. Knight E5, I think, is the... Although he does have knight B4. But I think queen f5 is solving my problems. Because I'm defending the bishop. And then I just end up a piece and three pawns to the good. His king is going to struggle to find any good shelter. My queen could try and invade. a4 is coming as well. If he tries to put the king on a square like a7. And if he tries to go to b7, I can always give him a check on e4 with the queen. I need to get my knight out, which, you know, if I could just have two moves in a row to play, like, knight d2, knight f3, that would be great. He doesn't trade, which I think is a good idea. Uh, he is threatening knight e3 with a big fork. Okay, it's kind of annoying. We could go f7. And if knight e3, then we take, queen takes, and then queen goes up. So f7, rook f8. Again, there's no obvious win, which is kind of annoying. Queen f2 is also a completely valid move. It might be the move that I play. My point is just to defend e3. Keep an eye on the bishop, g2, my bishop, f6. I'm kind of just controlling all the important squares... And now, I want to play moves like a4. I want to get my knight in the game. Because I am playing without two pieces. So it is actually difficult to prove my advantage right now. And I think my opponent is being smart with the way that he's going about this. f7, I think, is the move. Because he had a lot of pressure on the f6 square. So let's just push it. And now we're obviously one square away from queening. Which is going to be a constant threat. Knight e3 is on the... Could be played now. Rook e1, queen here. Takes, takes, check here. We can trade a lot of things if we do that. 
Queen e1. Maybe he is knight e3. I think rook e1 is actually quite a good way to go about this. Rook e1, queen f7. Takes, takes, check. Here, there, there. And then, I don't know, something like bishop e4. I think that's good. I know we're giving up our best asset, but we're up so much material that it's worth it to trade the queens, I think. And a pair of rooks. Although we actually don't have to trade the rooks. I actually might not trade the rooks, because otherwise we lack a lot of development. I also don't want to allow the knight into e3, so let's just develop. Maybe bishop e4 is the next move. Bishop e3 is also good with this pin. Um, there's a lot of good moves. Let's go a4. Let's start with a4. Just try and tear the queen side open a bit. I maybe want to play c4 as well. Black has no real openings now. Okay. b4, I think we can go c4. Let's kick the knight. If the knight goes to f4, I don't think I want to take because then I open the g file up. If knight f4, I think I want to play bishop e4. Okay, he backs off, so that makes our life easy. Let's go bishop 2e4. Uh, this is definitely his best piece. So if we can just trade it off, then again, it makes our life easy. Rook takes actually looks better to me. So I can double on the e file. If I take with a knight, I actually don't know where my knight's going. Okay, the knight isn't doing anything there. Let's offer a trade because trades obviously favor me. Up two pawns and a piece. So rook f1. Offer a trade. It's difficult for my opponent to decline this, actually. The knight also is going absolutely nowhere because we monitor it incredibly well. So that's a bonus because obviously knights are tricky. So if we can keep the knight, like, sort of tame by not allowing it access to any important squares, then, again, it makes our life easier. Because earlier I was a bit concerned about moves like knight e3. Even if there was no immediate, like, tactic or fork, I just don't want the knight getting in. Okay, let's trade. That uh, is kind of an obvious decision to me. Um, okay, how are we going to convert this? We could start pushing. In fact, I think that's exactly what I want to do. Knight f3 is also a completely valid move. Maybe d5, knight d4. But I think it's just as good to kick this knight around and push the pawn. Because like I said, it has no entry. It's got to retreat to a square like e7. And then... Mm, knight e7, we could play rook f4. Oh, now we're going to play rook f4. Because this is an issue for black. And we're going to force a trade. Knight here, bishop e3. We monitor the knight's forward movement. Again, this is classic chess geometry. When there's two squares between the knight and the bishop, let's go d5 because we know the knight can't advance, otherwise we're going to take it. And if the knight goes to c5, of course we're going to snap it off the board. Retreats. Let's bring our knight in. We could throw this pawn forward. This is incredibly winning. Um, obviously, let's throw the pawn in. Let's get the king up maybe. Our pieces do a great job of taking away loads and loads of squares in the enemy position. The knight is going to struggle to move forward. If the knight tries to go to d7, then pause the video, find the move. Okay, if the knight goes to d7, I want to play bishop to d5 to completely neutralize the knight's movement, like I just mentioned. Because it might not be the most accurate, but I think it's the most practical move to be played. Because this is Black's only possible asset, is his knight. So if we can completely neutralize the knight, he has nothing. Absolutely nothing. Of course, this is completely winning, but with low time, I'm sure some of you guys would find a way to blunder this. I'm sure I could find a way to blunder this. Um, we've all seen it happen on video many, many times. Okay, I'm not even going to bother engaging with him. I'm just going to push. I literally don't care. If he trades, then cool. Go for it. His knight can't move. 
again, I like I said, that was my whole strategy. Um, let's bring the king. Again, if the knight goes to d7, then I'm going to play bishop d4 to make sure the knight can't do anything. And if not, then I'm probably just going to go king g5 and h6, h7, h8. And again, we try and lock this king out from advancing anywhere near our pawns. We don't want to give it an option. Knight d7, bishop d5, king back. Okay, that doesn't do anything. Let's go forward. I don't want to play g7 because then the knight might use a square like h7. Of course, it's completely winning. In fact, that might have just been the simplest move. But I just want to make a queen. Yep, like I said, knight d7. We're going to move our bishop to dominate the knight. We can win this pawn. We can also just push. We can also push here. And I don't think black can actually stop this. Like, at all. Yeah, of course we're taking. Um, let's give a check. Knight f6 to follow, most likely. Yeah, knight f6 still to follow, because now we can't stop g8 queen, and this is game over. Checkmate should be in a couple moves. If we can find it. Let's just give a check here. Here we have mate. Here, this is mate. And there we go. That is game one. And I think a very, very solid game. Like, I don't think we made many mistakes at all. Our opponent, you could argue, made it easy for us by playing f6 so early. But we asked the question. We played bishop g5 and we were like, look, do you want to block this? And my opponent did want to block it. So yeah, let's get into the analysis. I would encourage sticking around for the analysis. It's not going to be a quick one because I... Sorry, it's not going to be a long one because I am aware that the game went on for quite a while. So yeah, let's see how I did. So another very high accuracy game in the Cairo Khan speedrun. 90.1% for me and 82.2 for my opponent. My opponent actually didn't play too badly, in fairness to him. He just kind of gave the game away rather early on. So let's run, run through the moves. C3, B6. This isn't a very typical, you know, sort of Kara composition. This is going to be something that, if you're playing it, you face very rarely, uh, whether from the white side or the black side. But the thing is, the Kara Khan system, it really does work against anything. And I think we proved that today. D4, bishop, b7, knight, f3. Part of the reason I play knight, f3 as well is just to block this diagonal a little bit. I put my bishop on g5, which isn't necessarily the best move, but I'm just asking my opponent what he wants to do. If he goes bishop, e7, I was just going to trade with him and then put the pawn on e3, get the classic Karo positioning, but I no longer have this bishop that gets blocked in by the pawns. And then I can try and play moves like bishop, d3, knight, d2. Let me just play some moves to show you what I mean. Knight d2, uh, let's say d5, castles, and I'm going to try and probably play e4 at some point, or just slow play the position. Personally, I think this is kind of what the Cairo Khan is about, just being really, really solid in the centre of the board, and then slowly coming out of your shell once you have all your ducks in a line, or in a row. Is it ducks in a row? I think that's the phrase. Anyway... My opponent goes f6, which actually is a good move, <laughs> according to the engine. It's its third favourite move. But it does pose some practical difficulties for my opponent. I go bishop f4, and Matt... I mean, the only way to actually justify f6, according to the engine, is either f5 or g5. f5 is an odd move, although I get it, because it's like a classic Nimzo Larson sort of setup, which normally happens with the white pieces. It's weird, he's playing like a Nimzo Larsen from the black side, and I'm playing a Karo from the white side. Or, it's apparently g5, bishop g3, h5 is the way to go about this. And that, you only play if you know it's playable, because you are weakening a lot of squares. And, honestly, I would be very, very happy to see this if my opponent had played it, because I have full confidence I would have been able to punish him for doing this. My opponent goes knight c6 though, and e4 is the best move, and I alluded to it in the game, like e4 is the move that you probably should play, 
But I'm playing Akaro, so we go e3 instead. d6, bishop b5, a6, we drop the bishop all the way back to c2. Apparently b3 was also good, looking at this pawn and the weakened squares. I suppose I might have tunnel visioned this idea a bit, but it's still absolutely fine. Again, g5 is the best move, and like you have to be so brave to play that. My opponent goes e5. And we play the best move. The only move to hold the advantage for white. Bishop g3. My opponent goes knight g to e7. Knight h4 is an inaccuracy apparently. I think... G5 is the best. Queen h5 and king d7. And the computer just claims this is fine for black. Again, tough to play from a human perspective. Here I probably play a move like knight f5. And if you do something like taking, things can get very bad very quickly. Like, you can only go into this line if you've calculated everything. And even then, I probably wouldn't do it if I was on the black side. So, yeah, you know, the computer's just being the computer. G6 is a great move, though. Just stopping Queen H5, quite simply. We castle. Queen D7. A4 is... I think, from here on out, A4 is probably always going to be an idea. But... F4 is also a good move, and I was very happy with this, and I think it's very difficult for black to actually respond. My opponent takes on d4, which is probably a good idea. If he had taken on f4, rook f4 was my idea, to go after f6, something like bishop to g7. I just thought I had a lot of pressure. Apparently dropping the rook back is the best, but you could also just take with the pawn and essentially just get what we got in the game. And f5, I think, personally, from a, I th from a practical standpoint, I think it was a good idea. So we have takes, takes, bishop h6. f5 is actually a mistake. But it's only a mistake if black doesn't respond. And queenside castle is the best move. a4 looks terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. But apparently it's fine. b4. f G. Personally, I wouldn't be taking this as white, though. I wouldn't want to win the pawns and give black a ton of open lines. Bishop b4 is good. I guess trying to challenge this bishop. I don't see what the problem with d5 is, though. Knight e5. I guess taking, you don't actually have an attack. And this knight is really active. But, I don't know. g5 is a blunder, though, because of queen h5 check. And, um... It, we asked the question, my opponent answered incorrectly. Queen h5 check, king d8, we take on h6, g h4. And again, you can take on h4, but queen f6 is more accurate. You can't take this because, you know, we force a queen trade, we go up and exchange, and two pawns, and this is just completely game over. So rook g8, we play queen h4, again the best move, because we're making the path open for the pawn and keeping our bishop nice and protected and any shenanigans on g2 are stopped king c8 we take on h7 which is again the best move knight d2 is also good because you know we need to develop the knight queen d8 f6 knight d5 and yeah queen f5 check f7 you can throw in if you want but queen f5 check is fine we win the knight and yeah, I kind of expected knight e5, but my opponent goes knight b4. Um, queen f5. Apparently we can take the rook. Queen g8, cb4. We have a lot of pieces for the queen. We have a bishop, a knight, and a rook. And we have a passed pawn. So let's say like queen f7. Well, then we have this. Queen f8. Maybe we push. Knight c3. Rook e8. I guess this is completely winning, but it's also unnecessary. We can just keep the queen on the board. Knight d5. He doesn't take our bishop, which I think is a smart decision. We go queen to f2. We could have played f7, but there's no need to add a ton of tactical complications for no reason. Uh, rook f8, f7, queen e7. We should have developed the knight. Rook e1 was inaccurate, but my, force, my thought process behind it is just force the trades. And black has nothing better. He has to trade with me. I go knight d2, king e7, a4, b4, c4. I'm just dislodging the knight. That was my idea with a4. Because if you take it, you're just creating a lot of weaknesses for yourself on the queen side. But 
bigger than that is I'm forcing the b5 pawn to make a decision which allows the move c4 to dislodge this strong knight on d5 because I don't like it. I don't like it there. So we go c4, boot the knight, bishop e4 because I just want to trade. Knight g6 I think was a bad move. I mean the game is over anyway but the knight has no way in. Like what's the knight doing on g6? We offer more trades, h4, we just start pushing, we force another trade of rooks, and in the end game, I mean, it's quite easy, really. Like, there's nothing to think that much about. We, you know, force the um, all the pieces off the board, promote, and then just give checkmate, so I'm not going to talk too much about that, to be honest. Uh, I think I explained far more than was necessary during the game. But yeah, that is game one. If you enjoyed, then please drop a like and subscribe if you haven't already. I would really appreciate it. And let's get into game two. All right, we have the black pieces and my opponent goes e4. So we are going to get a classic Karo Khan defense. Defense? Defense. My opponent is Samansk from the States. We have the knight c3 line. We might get the two knights. No, we have an exchange. But here is a little bit of a quirk of the position. In the exchange Karo Khan, normally you have pawns on c3 and d4. And then the knight goes to a square like d2. Here, my opponent has the knight on c3. And I'm going to argue that's a bit misplaced because the pawn should probably be on c3. There's nothing we can do to immediately take advantage of it. We're just going to develop like normal... Ah, uh, yeah, I did. Part of the reason for knight f6 was to defend the g4 square so I can maybe get this bishop out before I go e6. <clears throat> but there's also no rush. Let's go knight c6. Okay, bishop b5. I could play this. I could also go a6 and ask if he wants to s exchange. I don't know if I really want to exchange with him, though. e6 is a perfectly valid move. Mm, bishop g4, what have I got to be afraid of? Absolutely nothing. Part of the reason c3 is a good move as well is to give the queen the option of coming out this way. c4 is also a common idea in the Karo exchange, which is known as the Panov attack, and is probably the most testing line for black. But with the knight on c3, white removes all possibilities of the Panov or c3 to bring his queen out to a square like b3 or a4. So I think I can actually just develop this bishop with no concern. Because the queen can't add any more pressure to the position. e6, a6, bishop d6, bishop e7, castles, all normal moves here. Okay, e6. Let's just defend our center, open our bishop up. I want to get castled ASAP. Again, we could throw a6 in, but I also don't see the need. Like, if he, if he lets us keep my knight, then great. Um, if he moves the bishop back, then I also don't care. I feel like this is a bit unnecessary to play because I don't care if I lose my knight or not. You know, if he gives me his bishop, cool. If he doesn't, also cool. You know, he because c3 isn't on the board with opportunities to play queen a4 and queen b3, I don't actually care about his bishop. Okay, bishop g6 looks like the logical move here because he's broken the pin, so I'm just going to attack his queen, put pressure on c2. Knight e5 might be coming, but we're going to castle, so knight e5 could be met with taking. In Okay, so I think he's going to take and then put a knight on e5, which is logical. It is logical. Yeah, it's a good move from my opponent. c5 looks pretty tempting to me. Mm, I don't know if it works, though. Rook c8 might be good to prepare c5. Knight 2e5. Four just hangs the pawn, so let's not do that. I want to leave the option open for rook b8. I'd like to put this rook there, but I can't, because you can't just teleport your pieces, obviously. So, I think rook c8 is a perfectly valid move. Just defend c6. Maybe we're preparing knight to e4, with c6 now defended. Maybe we're preparing c5. And to be fair to my opponent, he has got a fairly equal position... But I think if anyone's going to be pushing for anything here, it's probably black. Black holds the cards with the c5 pawn break. I also currently have the bishop pair, although of course white could change that immediately. Um, 
Our pawn structure is also very solid in the center, which, I mean, obviously it is. It's the Karo Khan, right? That's the whole idea, really. Um, and yeah, white doesn't have much play. Again, this pawn really should be on c3. Because then he could have played moves like queen a4 to put pressure on my position. But he can't do that. And, you know, I am aware that my opponent is rated 1200. And my rating isn't actually 1400. It's like 2000 or... I nearly hit 2100 blitz on my main account recently, actually. Um, and I'm rated just under 2000 in classical over the board elo. So I know he's not going to know all the intricacies of the theory. I'm not criticizing my opponent. I'm trying to use like my opponent's mistakes and the intricacies of the position to explain to you guys so that you can better understand how to play in your games. That's kind of the whole point of this series, and basically most videos I make, this is kind of the idea. To try and analyse games that I play, or speak through games that I am playing live, so that I can, you know, teach you guys about some of the intricacies of the positions. Anyway, monologue over. Rookie 1 is a perfectly valid move, because white has a nice grip over the E5 square. C5 looks good. Knight E4... Well, let's calculate knight e4, because it's probably the most forcing line. Knight e4, we attack everything. I think he has two moves. After knight e4, he can take, or he can take on e7. If he takes on e7... Hmm. He could take back. Takes, takes. Don't love it. <laughs> no, I don't really love that. I think c5 is better personally i know i didn't spend that long calculating it but i just saw one variation that i didn't like and for me that was enough to reject it in a classical game i probably would have spent more time but yeah i don't know i didn't love that 94 might get played at some point in the game in fact there's probably like a 90 percent chance that it does if my opponent doesn't for some reason take me first i don't know why he would or if he takes here, then maybe this doesn't get played. But the thing is, if this knight moves, then I probably like I'm definitely going knight e4. And this knight is kind of in the way for white. It really is. The knight needs to be doing more. It would be far better placed on f3 defending this knight. And that would have been possible if he'd put it on d2 first. Okay, knight b5, he attacks a7. Valid. Queen b6 looks good though. We attack the knight, we defend a7, we put more pressure on the center, the bishop's opening up. If we take, then knight takes probably, and he defends c2 nicely. So I think queen b6 is good. I know the bishop is now undefended, so it gets more difficult to move the knight, but then we also have tactics with knight e4 and forks. Whereas if we go knight e4 now, then he can start with bishop e7 because he'll be attacking my queen. Although knight e4, bishop e7, queen e7, we defend a7, his queen's under attack. It's a valid line, completely valid line. Um, actually, it might be the best because if queen b6... He has ideas to take my knight and then go knight d7, forking the queen and the rook. Mm, don't love it. Okay, yeah, let's do this then. Let's do this. I, you know, if, if that tactic didn't exist with knight d7 at the end of it, then I would have played queen b6, but it does. And it's fine because he's forced to take me. Of course, after he takes, we could take his queen. And after he takes our queen. Meh, I don't love that position. Because we take back, then he wins a7. No, I don't want to get into that. So let's take here. If he takes here, then I can't really take his queen because he'll take our queen with check. So knight g6, hg6. We could take with the f pawn actually. To try and attack f7. Maybe f3 works. I don't see the need to weaken e6 for no reason, though. If knight g6, hg6, without an immediate tactic, I'm not going to play this. 
If there was an immediate tactic, yeah. if there was an immediate tactic, then sure, but there isn't. So we can just keep everything intact, keep the pressure on d4, and it just looks like a pretty nice position to be honest. Knight g6, hg6, let's say queen e3, queen e3, a6. Yeah, we're kind of just posing problems, especially on the c file, and our knight is very, very strong. That's a move I didn't consider. Kind of takes me by surprise. I should have considered it, really. Okay. Queen f6 is the first move that comes to mind. Just attacking f2. And putting pressure on e4. Let's say queen f6. Rook e2 takes, takes, mm, that's not amazing, I don't want to play a move like rook a8 because that's incredibly passive, um, a6 is actually on my mind, because if takes, maybe I can trap the queen, here, 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 Maybe I can win the knight somehow. Does a6 work? a6. Queen a6. Rook a8. Queen b6. Ah, uh, if rook b8, he can also go queen c7 and offer a queen trade. Although, takes, takes, rook a7, the knight has no way out. The knight's stuck. So we actually can't do that. He can't do that. We're setting a pretty nice trap here. A6. If he retreats the knight to like C3, then we can probably just take. Hmm. Yeah, probably. Hmm. A6, queen A6. Rook A8, queen B6. Rook B8, queen C6. Where's the win? Where's the win? I don't see how we... Like, we're just attacking the queen. We're not actually winning anything. Um, no, I don't think it works. So, okay. Let's consider queen f6 a bit more. I know I'm using a fair bit of time, but I also have a bit of time to spare. We also should consider taking here. And then, like, knight takes... Queen f6, he can go... Oh, he can't go queen d2, actually. Uh, how, did he def how does he defend both? Takes here, here. Yeah, he can't, because f3, I take with check. Although, after I take, he could take on a7. But if he takes on a7 with the knight, then rook c2, and he's in trouble. And if takes, queen takes. Queen takes, knight takes, rook c2. I'm up a pawn. I have pressure, I have pressure. The knight is kind of stranded as well. So, let's take. Let's take. I, oh, oh, bloody hell. Knight takes queen f6. He can just play knight f3. That's why I rejected this line in the first place. <laughs> All those moves ago. Although, then I have rook c2. And I am threatening f2 again. And if he takes on a7, let's say knight f3, rook c2, queen a7, probably rook f2 with ideas to sack the rook and potentially deliver checkmate. Although even if we don't actually deliver checkmate, the position is still horrible because everything in this, in this position is under attack, like the entire second rank. And we could even like potentially try and double up or something. I think this is very good. I think this is a very nice position. Uh, knight f3 should be the only move that is viable in any way, because otherwise it's just a simple double attack. And if you play a move like c3, then queen f2, king h2 is no good. I don't believe that can work. Or the rook c2, queen a7, if I go rook here, he can take here to remove the defender of the rook, so... 
rook c2, queen a7, probably knight to f2. But then we are also threatening knight to h3, g h3, and queen f3. So let's do it. And what I love about the Kairo Khan as well is look how solid our pawns are and our king is. Like, my opponent has no tactics on my king or any loose pawns in the center because there are no loose pawns in the center. They're all so well defended. And yeah, this is actually could be a problem for... Well, it will probably be a problem for my opponent. If queen a7, we can also con consider queen b2 to just absolutely demolish him on the second rank. Although, queen b2, rook f1. A really cool move would be knight g3. And he can't... Oh, he actually can take, because he actually isn't getting mated. Because the knight defends h2. Queen b2, rook f1. Uh, it's not immediately winning. Although... We can play knight f2 there. Because if rook takes, then we take his rook. But if we go queen b2, rook b1, then we can take here. If we go queen b2, rook e b1, queen c3, mm, I feel like knight f2 is the most decisive move. And then we can also we can always throw this in later. It, this, this pawn is going nowhere unless it moves, and then we still have a crushing attack. Let's just take. If my opponent wants to sack his queen, then he can go for it. Like, if he wants to do that, you know, I'm all for it. Because I'm up way too much material, and b2 will hang at the end of that line anyway. So that's fine. And again, we're threatening knight h3. And if we get knight h3 in... We're going to be up, what, two pawns? And after knight f4, g2 is going to be under massive threat. Um, I don't see how our opponent is going to defend that position. We all we also have a passed e and d pawn. So if worst comes to worst, we can always just push those. I know my opponent has two passed flank pawns. But they're not really going anywhere. They're way too far away. And he's going to try and invest in them. Okay, he's going to try. Knight h3 looks like the best move. By a country mile. Let's do it. If he takes, then he just loses immediately. He can't take that. So, if he goes for, like, king h2. Oh, he does take. No, he can't take that. Because we have too many threats. Right? We have way too many threats. Yeah, this should be just complete game over now. I don't see how our opponent defends this. The queen can't even retreat because we're just going to mate him. So we've got queen g2 mate. We have queen g3, king h1, queen h2 mate. It's completely game over. There's no need for our opponent to have accepted that sacrifice. Like, obviously, we are winning a pawn, yes. Really, he should just be pragmatic and be like, look, you've won a pawn, fair play. I'm going to have to try and hold on to this all the same. And, yeah, I mean, I'm still completely winning, obviously, but the game goes on. Anyway, that's game two. Let's get into the analysis. I would encourage you to stick around for it again. Uh, again, I, it's not going to be long because I know this. Uh, the two games have gone on for quite a while. But I hope you're still enjoying the video if you are still with me. Um, yeah, let's get into the analysis. Again, very, very high accuracy. 91.1% for myself. We're above 90 in both games. That's great. Uh, my opponent was 71.2. Let's get into the game analysis. E4, C6. Knight, C3, D5. And yeah, this is kind of just like a bad version of the exchange Caro. Because like I say, the knight doesn't belong on C3. If you play something like D4, D5, takes, takes... The idea is to go c3 straight away. And you can see. Actually, you can't see. Um, let's say bishop d3. Uh, knight c6, c3. The computer gives this position a tiny advantage for white. Like a tiny advantage. What we got in the game after d4 is a tiny advantage for black. So you can see the knight is a little bit misplaced on the c3 square. It's nothing that's going to completely end the game immediately. But it is kind of something that allowed us to grow our advantage over time. But not because the knight was on c3, 
per se, but more so understanding why the knight is misplaced on c3, if you understand what I mean. Because I was able to get my bishop out without worries about the queen getting out, because c3 doesn't allow the... Because he can't play c3, so his queen can't get in, right? And also because I know the knight should have been on d2 to go to a square like f3 to support his knight. Anyway, normal developing moves, right? We just play classic moves. It's basically equal. Bishop h5 is a mistake. g5, bishop g6, knight e5. Really? Rook c8? Is this actually that bad? Mm, I don't know if I would call this a mistake. Because the queen can't get in to actually exploit the weaknesses. H4 is oh, the only move to hold advantage for white, apparently. If white plays, I don't know, bishop f4, then knight d7 and black is absolutely fine. So I don't know if I would call it a mistake, but maybe an inaccuracy. My opponent castles, e6, bishop g5, bishop e7. I can put the bishop on d6, I suppose, but I just thought I'd break the pin to make my life easy. Queen d3, bishop g6, queen d2. And already in this position, I can see with the open C file and my bishop on this diagonal that I might be able, I might be able to exploit C2 in the future. So castles, bishop takes C6, I think was a very good move from my opponent. I think it was very practical because otherwise I'm going to play rook C8, and after you take, I'm going to take with the rook. Oh my god! Let's say you play. Rook e1, rook c8, and now you take. Now it's worse. Because let's say knight e5, rook c8. Um, f3 is the best move. That's never getting played. Let's just say rook d1 for the sake of argument. Then I can play moves like a6, b5, maybe go for b4, and try and put massive pressure on this c2 pawn. Because like I said, the pawn is not supposed to be on c2. Anyway. Anyway, anyway, he takes, which was a very good move. Knight e5. c5 immediately was good. Why did I reject this? Um, Why did I reject this? I think because of bishop f6. Bishop f6 and dc... No, sorry, not dc5. Knight g6, hg6, H G six and dc5. This is why I rejected this line. Queen a5, and I guess you're kind of just winning things back. You can't really hold on to this pawn. If you go for a move like queen e3, you'll just get forked. So, yeah, I didn't see this far in the future, but I also don't think it made that much of a difference. Rook c8 still is a great move. Rook fe1, and now we go c5. We try and break through. I didn't like this knight e4 line here, and I was correct in not liking it. Because after bishop e7, if I take here, then I'm just losing a pawn. So, if I take his queen instead, take the queen, bishop takes d8, rook takes d8. I just didn't think this was that great for me. He can take on g6, play, I don't know, knight a4 to try and get into c5. And I can't really kick that knight out very easily. Knight e4, f3, knight d6, knight c5. If anyone's winning, it's white. It's probably equal, but if anyone wins, white wins. So, I didn't go for that. I said go c5. We have knight b5, and that is a mistake. Queen b6 is the move. Now, oh, I'm an idiot. I'm actually just an idiot. He can't play this, because the knight just hangs. Okay, so queen b6 was the right idea, after all. Ugh. But okay, we go knight e4, which is the second best move. So I missed an obvious, really obvious thing. I bet a bunch of you were screaming at the screen when I did that. But this is still fine. Bishop e7, queen e7, knight g6. Fg6 is the best move? What about f3? Oh, the queen's hanging. What am I on about? Um, oh yeah, this is just an immediate tactic. You have to sack the rook. I mean, I'm an idiot. I really am an idiot, but although I made these mistakes, the moves I make still give me a very nice position. Queen a5, cd4 is the best move. Okay, I'm happy about that. 
am happy. A6 I did consider. I couldn't find the win after queen a6. Rook a8, queen b6. Rook fb8, queen c6. I didn't see how I win this. Rook c8, queen b6. I need to find queen d7. If I go here, and here, and here, he just goes back. Yeah, I need to find queen d7 here. No, not here. In this position. And let's just play. say he plays a nothing move. Then the idea is rook c6, and the queen is now trapped. This is quite like a silent but deadly move. I didn't notice this, and it's hard to find this kind of thing when it's after a sequence of like five or six forcing moves, and then you need to find a quiet move, just shifting your queen one square. That can be tough, but you can understand the idea of it once you see it, of course. And you go, oh yeah, obviously queen d7. Like, you just threaten rook c6, and how are you going to stop that? Yeah, but it is it's tough to see. It really is. So I'm not mad at myself at all for missing that. I think I made the practical decision with CD4, which is actually the best move. And Knight D4 just loses. So you have to play F3. Queen H4? What? Queen H4, FE4, Rook C2, and I'm just trying to mate white. Why would I... I don't see the need to sacrifice the Knight, though. But I guess it does kind of answer some of white's issues. It really does. A6 is the best move. Okay, but let's say knight d6. Knight d4. Queen f6. C3. Knight c4. Queen a7. Even knight b2. And white has a lot of problems in the position. So I think I can still easily convert this. But yeah, after knight d4, we have queen 2 f6. Knight f3 is the only move to try and play on. Um, queen b2 is a good move, but rook c2 is the best. And, yeah, my opponent goes queen a7, which rook f1 is better, just to defend this pawn. And the thing is, I didn't even calculate rook f1. I only calculated queen a7, because queen a7 restores material equality. If my opponent goes rook f1, I knew it was like, even though this is the best line for, for white, I know this is game over. Because he has nothing. He just has absolutely nothing. And yeah, I have these tactics like I was going on about. And I'm just up two pawns with a big attack. And my knight is amazing. I'm winning the rook anyway. Unless he goes rook b... Sorry, rook f1, queen c3. I'm threatening queen trades. This pawn is probably going to fall. I have two passed pawns in the center. And a big attack if the queen stay on the board. So I didn't even bother calculating rook f1. And my opponent went queen 2, a7 to restore material equality. Knight f2. Rook f2 was also playable. I was a bit concerned about rook e4, which is the best move. And the only way black really has an advantage here is if I find rook g2, king g2, d e4 attacking the knight and threatening queen b2 check to pick up the rook. So rook f1 takes, rook takes here, here. And this is the best line for white. Unnecessary for me to calculate all that though. I can just play knight f2. And although there's not an immediate win, I have a lot of threats. My opponent goes b4, and that allows knight takes h3. The best line for white was rook f1 to put pressure on my knight, and I guess defend the knight indirectly. If I go here, here, the um, rook would defend the knight. The best move is just rook b2. And if you take, then I guess I just take, and then your rook's going to hang at the end of it. But yeah, b4 I think was quite a natural move from my opponent. It's a bad move, but it's a natural move. Because I don't have an... It doesn't look like I have an immediate threat. But yeah, knight h3 and um, the pawn's overloaded. Of course my opponent should not be taking. By the way, after king h2 you can just take the knight because of the pin on the pawn. So king h1 was the move that I expected. And I have so many moves here. I can just go back. Deliver a check. Put the knight back on e4 even. And just try and grind out a win. Knight d3 is also good to attack the rook and here. Oh yeah, this is really good actually. I have so many threats. But either way, he takes. I take on f3 and my opponent resigns because there is absolutely no way he can stop checkmate. 
apart from just throwing a bunch of pieces in the way to get taken. And yeah, I think a very, another very solid game. We play a lot of typical Karo Khan ideas. And I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you made it to the end of the video, then I love you guys. I like genuinely really appreciate it. Like I hope this is entertaining and educational. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't have stuck around like over an hour. So you're the man. Whoever's watching, you're the man. Um, I bet this footage only gets seen by like five people, if that. So this is exclusive. Anyway, I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you very much for watching.